and then Chief Jason Armstrong will come up and share an update on the case. He'll also take a few questions. Um, so if, when we get to that point, if you would state your name and your media affiliation, that'd be really helpful for us. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started, please, Mayor Dill. Thank you, Stacy. Good morning. First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here today. And uh, I want to also offer my deepest, deepest condolences to the families of Nancy Taylor and Gabrielle Raymond. And I also want to take this time to acknowledge and thank all of the first responders who were part of the response on Monday. Um, after receiving the call, they responded courageously. I want everyone here today to understand that our community is devastated by the events that occurred on Monday. Our entire town is currently grappling with an overwhelming sense of grief. And I want to respectfully request your support in handling the media coverage of this tragic event with the utmost sensitivity. It's come to my attention today that we will be releasing 911 calls, and Chief will talk about that in his statement. This is a very difficult time for all the families and may I add our entire community. In this challenging time, I believe it's crucial for the media to demonstrate compassion and empathy. And as the mayor of the town, I ask all of you to use your best discretion when reporting. Your cooperation in this matter will not only respect the privacy and dignity of the families affected, but also foster a sense of healing and support within our community. And again, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. And I want you to also continue to lift up our community in prayer and also love and support. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Gilbert. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jason Armstrong. I serve as the police chief here uh, for the town of Apex. Uh, so, as you all are uh, aware, um, you know, with this incident, we've received a lot of requests for information, a lot of questions um, and things. Of course, you know, the 911 calls um, is something that, that most of you all have, have asked for. And so we've finished uh, getting all of them uh, edited uh, and downloaded and, and edited, redacted, what, what information needed to be redacted from it. And so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the recordings that you're going to hear once we send them out and, and add some context to it uh, and and provide a little bit um, more insight and information into some of the things that we know uh, took place uh, on Monday. One thing that I wanted to start off with, uh, we received a lot of questions and inquiries about what our history, uh, the police department's history and uh, previous history and involvement with uh, Mr. Hardman was. And before this incident happened on Monday, the only other interaction that the Apex Police Department had previously had with Mr. Hardman was just this past December. On December 11th of 2023, Mr. Hardman came here to the police department to report a cell phone. Uh, he turned over found property. Um, I guess he was an Uber driver and uh, somebody that he uh, gave a ride to through the Uber service had left their cell phone in his vehicle and so he came here to turn in that cell phone to us um, and so before that uh, we had not had any uh, interactions uh, any calls for service or anything uh, involving Mr. Hardman uh, before before Monday. Before I get into some of the calls that came in and, and, and what I want to talk about uh, one thing that I wanted to explain is how our 911 system is, is set up here uh, and how calls come in. So we do have a, a dispatch center here uh, in Apex and inside the Apex Police Department, but our dispatch center is considered a secondary dispatch center. So it's called, the acronym is, is PSAP, which stands for Public Safety Answering Point. And so we are a secondary public safety answering point. We partner with the Cary Police Department and their communication center, and so they are our primary public safety answering point. So what that means is here in Apex, 
when you call 911, that 911 call is going to ring in Carrie's dispatch center. It's going to ring in Carrie's dispatch center, and then when they get the address of the emergency or, or where the call is, then the call is automatically transferred to the dispatch center here in Apex to get the officers dispatched uh, out to the call. Um, and so with this incident, the very first call that came in that day was placed on our non-emergency number. And so if you call the Apex Police Department's non-emergency number, that phone call comes directly to our dispatch center and is answered by our dispatchers. And so on the day of the incident, the, I'll wait for the train to go by. On the day of the incident, the first call that came in came in at 3.02 p.m. It was a call made on our non-emergency number from one of the, the residents out there at, um, at Southwalk. And what that caller was calling to tell us was that there was an individual out in the back of the complex that was being very loud and, and what the caller said, the individual was screaming at the sky. So the individual was screaming at the sky, was pacing back and forth, and uh, had a pool stick in his hands uh, that he was kind of waving around. So the information that the dispatcher was receiving, the dispatcher started putting the call information in to dispatch this as a crisis call. Um, and so we call that a, a CIT call, a crisis intervention team. It was a crisis call. So the call came in at 3.02. The dispatcher is talking to the caller, is collecting the information, and is asking all of the questions that we ask when we're processing a CIT type call so we can pass that information on to the officers. While the caller is speaking with the dispatcher, uh, the caller also informs us that an, an older lady has, has walked up outside and is talking with the individual that is outside making um, the, the noise. And we believe that that was one of our victims, Nancy Taylor. Um, Nancy Taylor is heard walking up and begin speaking with Mr. Hardman. With Mr. Hardman, um, but then it, it the the caller says that he believes they're walking away because he can no longer uh, hear them, uh, hear their voices outside. And just a, a few seconds later, the caller states that they believe that they just heard gunshots. In our call system, it shows that the first officers who were dispatched to the CIT call were dispatched at 3.05 p.m. So the call comes in at 3.02 p.m. on our non-emergency line as the dispatcher is talking with the caller and asking the questions that we ask and getting the information. The call is being typed into the system, and so the first officer is dispatched at 3.05 p.m., but that officer is dispatched to a, a CIT call, which does not garner um, an emergency response. So the officer is not driving their lights and sirens because we, we hadn't received any emergency information yet. Additionally, at 3.05 p.m. is when the first 911 call comes in. That 911 call, as I stated earlier, goes to the Cary Police Department. So they answer that 911 call at 3.05 p.m. Oh, well, I'm done with that paper. That first 911 call uh, that came into uh, Cary's Dispatch Center came from Gabrielle Raymond's cell phone. On that call, unfortunately, Ms. Raymond did not get a chance to speak to the dispatcher. She did not get a chance to say anything to the dispatcher. On that 911 call, the only thing that we hear are gunshots and screams. From everything that we have uncovered from our investigation um, to this point, uh, we are, are confident, we are certain that what we are hearing on that 911 call is the moment that uh, Ms. Taylor and Ms. Raymond are shot and killed uh, by Mr. Hardman. 
another night. So as you mentioned, so at, at 3:05 p.m. is when the the shots start. Um, when the shots are fired, and so that triggers a lot of the community members in that neighborhood to start calling 911. So a bevy of 911 calls start to come in, and so all of those calls are coming into Cary, and Cary is, once they get the information of where the call is, then those calls are being transferred to our dispatch center here. Um, so, you know, those all those calls will be provided uh, in the release that we send out after this, but there's one additional call that I, I did want to uh, talk about, and that's a call that comes into 911 at 3:08 p.m. And that call comes from another resident in the neighborhood. And what we learned from from that call and, and from that resident is when the shots go off, and this resident hears the shots, this resident looks outside and sees that there's a gunman outside. Resident goes and grabs his gun and runs outside to confront and challenge the shooter. Um, and as he's challenging the shooter, um, he calls, he has a cell phone out and he calls 911 uh, to report what's going on. Uh, there are no gunshots that are exchanged between Mr. Hardman and this courageous uh, resident. Uh, but after a few seconds of their confrontation, uh, Mr. Hardman flees from that interaction and begins to retreat towards his residence. So, like I said, that was at 3.08 p.m. is when we got uh, the 911 phone call from that uh, community member. And at 3.09 p.m. is when the first officer arrives on scene. So right as that, that interaction is, is unfolding and Mr. Hardman is running away from uh, that individual, officers are arriving on scene. So officers arrive on scene at 3.09 p.m. Uh, they spot Mr. Hardman uh, in the front of his residence and he is retreating inside his residence. Mr. Harmon, when they see him, he is holding a rifle at this point in time. So when they first see him um, at the front of his residence, he is holding a rifle. Um, as more officers start to arrive on scene, uh, officers kind of split up. So we have some officers that run to the victims and they start rendering aid and checking on the victims and, and setting up um, uh, protection for the officers that are, are checking on the victims. And we have other officers that are setting up a perimeter around the area, um, as we know, a general area where the suspect has gone um, inside uh, the residence. As officers are setting up the perimeter, they hear a single gunshot um, that is, it sounds like it comes from the back of the residence. And officers immediately run to that area where they heard the gunshot come from, come from and that's where officers encounter Mr. Hardman in the backyard, essentially, um, of his residence. Uh, he is still in possession of uh, the rifle. It's an AR-15 style rifle. Uh, officers confront and challenge him uh, with their weapons drawn. They give him commands to drop the weapon, uh, which he complies with. He does drop the weapon and he does comply with our orders to get on the ground. And at that time, officers uh, took him into custody and placed uh, handcuffs on him. Um, and that, that brought the situation um, to, to an end. Uh, as you all saw in the previous um, release that we sent out, one of the charges that Mr. Hardman was charged with um, was a cruelty to animal uh, charge. We did find in his residence uh, his dog, um, which um, we learned was his dog, uh, had been shot and killed also. Uh, from everything that we have looked at and, and uncovered with this, we strongly believe that the dog had been shot and killed before these events took place um, that afternoon uh, at 3 p.m. Um, so we, we don't know an exact timeline or, you know, yeah, we don't know exactly when the dog was, was shot and killed, but everything that we have gathered thus far and where the dog was and the timeline of everything that we've been able to piece together, we're pretty certain that the, the dog had already been shot and killed by Mr. Hardman before uh, the shooting incident with uh, our other two victims. So
So those are, are some of the the 911 calls uh, recordings that you all are going to get when we send them out. Um, that I, I wanted to provide some context to. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some statements that have been provided to me to read on individuals' behalf um, to share with you all and to share with the community. Uh, the first statement is from the resident that ran out to confront Mr. Hardman. Um, you know, what we typically see uh, when something like this comes out is we know the media wants to talk to that individual and wants to know who they are and, and get them on um, get them on camera and all of those things um, and so that that courageous individual provided a statement for me to read to you all today and here is this statement around 3 p.m. on Monday January 15th I heard gunshots that prompted me to open my door and see what was happening as a neighbor I was attempting to keep him from hurting anyone else until the police arrived. With that said, I hope you will respect my privacy and allow me to process this horrible tragedy without intrusion. The next statement I'm going to read is a statement from the family of Nancy Taylor. Ms. Taylor's family says, it is impossible to adequately describe what our family is going through since the senseless and sudden loss of our beloved family member, mother, and grandmother. Nancy doted on her grandsons, moving her life to North Carolina to be close to them. We have a strong faith in God and know Nancy will forever watch over our family. We want to thank the first responders for their courageous actions in responding to this horrific incident and the courageous resident who confronted the suspect. Our greatest desire now is to be granted privacy to grieve and process this incredible and lasting tragedy. And the last statement is a statement from the family of Gabrielle Raymond. We are grieving the unimaginable loss of our beloved daughter, granddaughter, sister, aunt, and friend, Gabrielle. Our hearts are broken and our minds cannot comprehend how or why such a bright light and future was taken too soon from this world. During this time, we would appreciate the space and privacy to navigate this terrible and senseless tragedy that's taken place. So that is all that I have to share from my update. Um, I do want to reiterate a message that the, the mayor shared. Um, you know, this is a, a tragedy that no community wants to experience and, and every community um, worries if they will ever be the, the next one. Um, and, and when we have these unfortunate things happen, uh, what I wanted to remind, what I want to remind everybody of is just the, the impact and the, the trauma that not only the family endures, but the people of the community uh, endures with this. And, and, you know, like Mayor Gilbert alluded to, I'm, I'm asking our partners in the media to be sensitive to that and, and to understand that there are loved ones that are, are left behind after this tragedy uh, has unfolded. And, and you know, with some of, the, some of the things that you're going to hear in the 911 calls, in particular, the call that came from Ms. Raymond's cell phone, uh, I would just say, just think about if, if it was your loved one on the other end of that, and how would you want that played out uh, for the world to see? So, with that being said, I will take some questions. I think maybe the first question, these are from CBS 17. The first question I think needs to go to the mayor. We know the police officers have professional grief counselors that they can deal with in situations like this. Mr. Mayor, if you'd step up to the microphone and tell us, what can the town do at this point to try and help the people in that neighborhood beyond just offering prayers and thoughts? What can they do to try and help them get through this traumatic moment? I think the most important thing to understand is that uh, this entire community is grieving. So when one member of this community 
it's hurting, we all do. So it's really important that we get to a healing process. And what we're, the message today is for you to help us with that. So if the media could step in and help us get through that, I think each and every member will start to get to a healing process. So that's what we want to happen. Are you happen. considering some sort of memorial service or something like that at one point to try and help the neighborhood? Sure. I, I would like to work with the police department and the community and again, uh, work with the families, of course, and, and get to a healing for our community. So, absolutely. But, but before, before the next question, I, I want to address that question also. Um, and so some of the resources that we have here at the Apex Police Department, we have victim advocates, we have crisis counselors, we have chaplains, and our entire network and team has been activated uh, after this tragedy. Um, and that's providing services and resources to the family members, that's providing services and resources to the people in that community that have been impacted by this. And so every, every ounce of our department and our resources and everything that we have have been activated to help people uh, deal with what has gone on out there and to serve them. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, been a few days. Have you been able to glean perhaps what led up to this? I, I'm, you have to speak loud. I can't hear the question. It's been a few days. Have you been able to glean any information? What led up to this? I don't know if the suspect has been cooperative, but were there any indications that perhaps he had an HOA associated issue, a notice of some sort, maybe he was fined? What caused this? So we don't know uh, what caused this. Uh, we don't have anything. Um, that we have uncovered in our investigation at this time that points to, you know, this was a potential catalyst to, to this happening. Um, like I said, it all started with that initial call that we got, uh, Mr. Hartman being outside and his behavior out there is what prompted people to either call us or look outside to see what was going on. Um, and and so we, we haven't we haven't uncovered anything. I've heard some of the rumors also about HOA issues and things. That's that's not anything that we've uncovered uh, as a part of our investigation that would suggest it, it contributed to, to what happened out there that day. Chief Matt Palmer from WRL. Do you believe that he intended to kill more people based on being out in that backyard with another tried a different kind of weapon? So we can never say definitively what's going on in somebody's mind and what somebody's intentions are. Um, but as a career law enforcement professional, when we see somebody pick up a weapon like that and then they go outside, they're normally intending to, to use it. And so I, I definitely believe um, that the actions of our officers out there and challenging him in that backyard saved lives that day. What time about do you anticipate that those 911 calls will be distributed? It should be shortly, just as soon as I can get back inside and, and we can we can get everything cleared up in town. We, we, we don't. I mean, they were neighbors. Um, they, they lived in the same neighborhood. Uh, they were all lived in the same general area. Um, but beyond that, uh, I'm, we're not aware of any, you know, real association or connection between uh, any of them. All right. Thank you all for coming out. So, guys, if you have specific email addresses that you'd like to receive um, the information from, please uh, write that down on the table here, and we'll get those. Um, I have one more calls to you.